Welcome. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and today's uh, topic will be optimal, optimality in evolution. And so uh, if we think about the course, we, we're starting a new chapter, you might say. We, we had uh, three classes on network motifs. And then we had three classes about robustness. All right, the course is organized according to principles. Take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Welcome. Uh, we talked about um, absolute concentration, robustness, using uh, where the input output function is independent of the protein concentrations using a bifunctional kinase that's also a phosphatase, paradoxical component. <laughs> And we talked about robustness of exact adaptation in chemotaxis, where a six protein circuit can na navigate the bacteria up gradients. And, and using integral feedback loops, you can be guaranteed that even if you um, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief, even if the gradients that you're climbing are changed very w widely in orders of magnitude, you can still detect them because you can adapt back to the, to the basal, baseline level. And then we talked about uh, how, how circuits can detect relative changes. And, so those, uh, and therefore be robust to, to factors that multiply out the input field, like uh, the ambient light and vision, and uh, the source strength in bacterial chemotaxis <coughs> or, or variations of protein levels in, in human cells. And so all these, um, all these network motifs and their functions and all these circuits that give you robustness are, you might be wondering, uh, who made them? How did they come to be? How are they so beautiful and, and perfect? How are they there despite the chances, I mean, what are the chances that you take a, you take a, a bunch of Legos and you throw them in the air and they come down and they build a beautiful castle, let's say. Not, chances aren't so big, right? So what's going on here? And uh, that's, what, um, that's what I'd like to discuss in the next few lectures uh, about evolution, talk about evolution, how things came to be. And uh, unlike usual treatments of evolution, which are um, qualitative, we want to use evolution to make a quantitative predictions and understand the numbers in the circuits. And, and the main uh, framework for that would be the idea of uh, optimality, the relation between evolution and, uh, and, the, um, and optimizing something. And what that is is what we'll describe today. So by the end of this lecture, uh, my goal is that you'll understand some things about evolution and also about um, how we can use it to, to quantitatively predict or compute numbers that otherwise we wouldn't understand what they're there for. In particular, to, in this uh, class, we'll talk about the simplest case, which is what, how does evolution decide, you might say, what's the expression level of a protein? How many copies of a certain protein to make? Why not make 50,000? Why not make 70,000? Why make 60,000 per cell in a certain situation? I don't mean how. You know how. There's transcription factors that can change, bind the promoter, change the expression level, and get you any level that you want, basically. But why that particular level? The why question. All right? Okay, so that's, that's where we are. We're starting on a new topic. What was is in the past, is in the videos, thanks to you. It's recorded, and you'll soon be able to see it. And now we start something fresh. Let's take a nice deep breath. 
All right. Here's another opportunity for a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> All right, so uh, when we talk about evolution, um, we talk about the process where, or actually, maybe I would say natural selection, Darwin's theory of natural selection. We, we talk about the, pr the following process. We, we can imagine a, a population of, of organisms, like bacteria, in a test tube, for example, if you want. And they all have uh, identical DNA. And uh, when they divide, this division process sometimes makes uh, changes in the DNA. Right? So there's uh, mutations, changes in the DNA. The rate is about 10 to the minus 9 per DNA letter per division. E. coli DNA is about 5 million letters. So you can see that um, not every, not every generation, there's even one mistake there. It's rare. It's once every, let's say, few hundred generations. That's very, very typical of animals. One every 300 generations, usually, is the number. The genomes are big, but the error rates are small. So genomes are small, error rates are big. And the DNA is different, so something might uh, really break down. Some protein might not be functioning. The cell might die. Et Maybe there's uh, rarely an improvement and that cell, let's say, can make more, more babies or grow faster or something like that. And in a situation where um, we have a, you put the bacteria in a test tube, there's plenty of food, and they start growing exponentially. If you're growing a little faster, because it's an exponential process, you're, you're, of course, your babies have the same DNA, usually, because Usually, mutations are rare. So that, if you have a mutant that grows a little faster, that mutant is going to exponentially increase in frequency. And maybe, after a while, take over the population. So if we talk about fitness, which is a mysterious thing. Okay, fitness is a mysterious thing in general. Fitness is defined in different ways. Let's say number of, um, of offspring, that survive, for example. It's, fitness here, this is a big charged word, and, you, uh, and we're going to talk about an experiment where you can sim simplify it. And in nature, you look at zebras and giraffes and dolphins, and you can define fitness in different ways. Uh, if we talk just about a test tube, exponential growth, then you might say that fitness in this situation, it looks like the growth rate and the number of cells grows exponentially with time, right? So number of cells grows exponentially with time. You have some initial number of cells. And if you have even one cell here, let's say, that uh, grows faster, F prime, greater than F, because it's an exponential process, it's going to take over. You know what I mean? So, so this fitness is uh, fitness is uh, is important, and uh, if we don't have uh, small populations and stochasticity, and if everything is constant and limitless, etc., the fitness averaged over all individuals. tends to increase. Caveats. Okay. There's many way, reasons this is not true, but in this situation, idealized situation I told you, 
Uh, because if you're making more babies, though, the, your DNA gets, uh, in the next generation, more represented, and those babies will have more babies. And that's, then there's a new mutant that arises, makes more babies per unit time. It's going to take over, etc. So fitness tends to increase in natural selection. This is the process of natural selection. Um, any questions so far? Um, good point. So it depends how you define the growth rate. Um, if, it's, if it's, let's say, the growth rate could be log 2 over the generation time, for example. Right? And then, then it's, uh, it's 2 to the power uh, time over generation time, which is e to the power f times. So it depends how you about how you define it because of the yeah yeah um, uh, right so this is a fitness average over all the individuals in the population so uh, in this idealized situation of a, of a test tube. Uh, you can now take all the bacteria there and measure their growth rate okay. and, um, and define the average fitness. Because the population with, with, the, with the, the individual with the higher growth rate takes over in this in infinite test tube situation. Yeah. So actually, you can do experiments with the infinite test tube situation, as I'll show you, or simulate to experiment with it. To, to make a copy of that in the lab and, and test ideas like this. Now, of course, natural uh, populations aren't infinite. So a lot of situations like this, the number of dolphins maybe is constant in the ocean. So each generation, there's births and deaths. So the fitness there is more complicated. It has to do both with making babies and having them survive to make babies. So maybe number of grandchildren or something like that. But if you have a dolphin with a genome that gives the dolphin higher fitness, in this sense, again, that those genes' frequency will increase in the population over many generations, even if population size stays constant, because there's death balances birth. There's, so, how do you say? Selection of the fittest? That's, that's Diorin's idea. Um, so fitness, again, says there's a big problem that's, it's, you, have, it's, you have to define it, and, and, and these are the lectures, we're gonna like really define it, uh, as you'll see, it, as you can already tell, it has, more than one component, growth and survival, for example. Today, I'm only going to talk about experiences that deal with growth. So it's a multi-objective optimization problem. And it's very interesting. So let's keep it a little vague for a second. OK, yeah? In this sample case of the infinite uh, tube, where the fitness tends to increase, if it can't increase infinitely, what would eventually limit it? OK, so the question is, what would limit it in the test tube? And the answer is that and then you run out of the limiting nutrient, the carbon source, or you secrete so much junk that you stop growing. So dilute it. Suppose it's either and if you keep diluting it, then uh, nothing stops it, and that's the kind of experiments you can do. So E. coli can grow forever. Yeah, but the, 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 thing is the growth rate increases, not the Oh, I see. Right, right, right. So fitness, av so fitness increases, 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 but it, it doesn't, uh, it, can, uh, it can go like this. Okay, so what's the, split, so what's the uh, fastest possible growth rate that a bacteria can have, for example? So that's actually an open question. What sets it? We know that E. coli, in world record, can go down to 20, doubling every 20 minutes. And uh, Ron Milo told me that there's a bacteria that can replicate itself something like amazingly, like once every eight minutes, I think, or something like that. Which, and then there is, a, there is a limit, because in order to replicate, for instance, the ribosome that makes proteins needs to duplicate itself. And if you calculate the rate of making a protein, so it goes at 20 amino acids per second, and needs to make such and such, a, I don't know, it has 100 proteins, each one with, let's say, 10,000 amino acids going at such and such, you have a, a speed limit for how, how quickly you can replicate it. And it comes close to this eight minutes. So, and, and, and you also duplicating the DNA, you have to duplicate all those five million letters. So you have a, an enzyme doing that at, let's say, a few tens of letters per second, and E. coli uh, gains speed by um, 
start starting to replicate the next copy already when it's open. There's a lot of ways to save speed, but so there's some, some chemical limits to how quickly you can self-replicate. Also, how much quickly you can transport things. And so so there's, you, can't, uh, you can't duplicate a biological organism in a millisecond. It's probably, the world, probably there's a limit in around 10 minutes. Maybe uh, you can ask, why is that? Why not make it faster? So there's probably an accuracy speed trade-off where you start making more errors if you try to exceed that. And but actually, that's, that's really an interesting question, I think. So. Diffusion limit, yeah. So here, for, for people who wanna who like extremes, try to try to think about how you can make the fastest duplicating organism. Okay, so theoretically, um, so the theory of evolution of natural selection loves to use the concept of the fitness function. introduced by C. L. Wright in the 1930s. And it's a very simple concept and useful. On the y-axis is fitness, and on the x-axis is some trait of the organism. In fact, it's a multi-dimensional space, because uh, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and our organism has many traits I can measure with a ruler. And your height, your weight, your, no, no, or the bacteria is uh, each gene, you know, the expression of each gene, et cetera. So it's a multi-dimensional space, but let's talk about just one trait. So, um, and in particular, I'm going to be interested in, in this talk, just as an example, the expression level of a certain protein in the cell. So it could be zero, one copy per cell, two, 10,000, 100,000, you know, et cetera. And if we plot this fitness function, we can ask, what shape does it have? So you can imagine different kind of shapes here. It could be, a lot of times you think of a mountain like that. And if it's a mountain like that, let's call this trait Z, then this is the optimum level. And Actually, we use star in this course for activity, so I'm really sorry. I'm going to change to opt. Z optimal, optimal level. And if you uh, take the initial condition that you're here somewhere, and now you do the uh, evolutionary game, that is to say you let the bacteria grow, have mutations, etc. And natural selection will tend to increase, and you can ask, do we actually get to the top of this mountain? Or maybe we, we, don't, we can't reach it. Uh, how quickly do you go? All these are kind of open questions and interesting questions. But the idea is that you go here. Now, it's very important for me to say that this fitness uh, function, of course, it depends on the conditions. Sometimes uh, you need this protein, sometimes there's a condition change, you don't need it anymore, or you need a different level of it. So in each condition, diff I change conditions, maybe now this fitness function moved. So I was here, I need to get here. Okay? You can do that with uh, gene regulation, of course, if you add more or less of the sugar, you have more or less of the gene. But I'm talking about in the same sugar concentration, maybe in one condition it's optimal to have 10,000 copies of the protein, but now you move to a new environment you haven't seen before, and now it's already optimal to have 20,000. You need to start to adapt. And this process of generation by generation, generation by generation, change in the trait is called evolutionary Adaptation. Uh, it's the same word as uh, exact adaptation, sensory adaptation, chemotaxis, but that happened on a single generation. I added, added attractant and, and things uh, adapted. Here I'm talking about DNA changes, mutations, heritably change your DNA and therefore change your traits. <coughs> That's called evolutionary adaptation. Okay, so we're going to study this problem in a very simplified case. Now, uh, 
When you look at, at hills like that in mountains, you can maybe see that there could be problems. For instance, nobody guarantees that this hill is, uh, is so smooth and, and flat like Mount Fuji. Maybe it looks different. Maybe it looks like this. When you change conditions, we change the shape of the curve or move the curve. So that's really, again, not a lot of data about that. It can, do, it can be anything. So, um, so imagine if you have a fitness landscape like this. These points here are called local maxima. Local maxima. So if I start here, I can have high, there is a higher fitness solutions. But I need to go through the valley of the shadow of death in order to get there. Okay, so the question is why do I uh, have to go down? So the mutations, what the mutations do, they change the genes and the genes make these traits. For example, mutation can make the protein be less often degraded, therefore increase in concentration, example. Uh, it's, in principle, it's possible to have a big mutation like that. Yeah, and then you can jump. Uh, a lot of times mutations aren't so big, and you have to accumulate a few of them, and then you have to go down through this valley. But I, again, a lot of things are possible. Did I answer your question? Ah, uh, why did I drive like this? Here. Oh, I see. So you have a mutation that goes here. Yeah. So uh, when you so if it's at the same height and you put both of them in the test tube, they'll have this neutral situation where fluctuations will deter. If it's a little higher, then this one will take over. Maybe go like this. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Good point. Yeah. Thanks. So the question is, maybe we can evolve the size of mutations, you can see, and uh, to get a good search situation. So uh, there's actually data in the last few years about what's called the mutation effect size distribution. And in fact, it's, it's exactly what you said. The, the, this is the, uh, the size of the effect of the mutation. Size of the effect of the mutation means how big this arrow is, you might say, how big the change in trade is. Okay. And this is the, uh, the probability of that mutation. So if I take all the mutations, let's say 100,000 mutations, calculate their effect size on a, on a given trait, and plot the, the probability distribution. Uh, it looks like this. So there's, there's, uh, it's what's called the... Uh, L-shaped distribution it can be described well by certain kind of gamma functions. And it, it's, it's enriched for, for a lot of mutations of small effect and a few mutations, rare mutations of large effect. That's correct. Yeah. How can the organism anticipate when it does a mutation, what will be the effect in order to generate such a function? So what, how can it, something probabilistic that yeah. most uh, mutations are of small effect. So how can the uh, organism anticipate the size of mut if mutation it needs? So we think that the organisms can anticipate the size and the direction of the mutation and where it will occur. The mutations are random. And natural selection works through this fitness. The ones that work well are amplified by this process of making babies. So, uh, and there is also a debate about that. Because in some situations, people think there's what's called adaptive mutations, which is this idea that goes uh, attributed to Lamarck, this very brilliant uh, scientist that was saying, OK, if the giraffe needs to stretch its neck to reach the leaves, its babies will have longer necks, right? So use is what signals the change. That was before, uh, of course, 
150 years before it was known what mutations are, which occurred in the 1950s and 60s. Okay, so Darwin didn't know how mutations work. And so they were all theorizing, actually. In the 1930s, they didn't know how mutations work. And, and uh, a lot of people, uh, theorists, love this idea of mutations of small effect, because then you can kind of do this linear analysis and like, things flow. It's our, and ma nature does not uh, jump, make big jumps. And there was a lot of debate about that. Now we know really a lot more, I mean, even the size effect. So Dar I think uh, this is quite new knowledge. And, and there's uh, some evidence that in some cases, if you, you're in problem in some gene, that creates some damage there and, and the DNA. And then uh, you have more mutations in that gene, which is kind of a link between what you need and the mutation probability. But those are probably n very, very rare exceptions. So you can think about random mutations and then selection. And, all right, so we have the problem of local maxima, so we can get stuck. Uh, if it's a multidimensional space, you can get lost in these big, big valleys which ne with neutral uh, ch changes. And high-dimensional fitness functions, you can be really dizzy to think. On the other hand, you can bypass through in this direction a valley. So you can, if in one direction you can go down, in another direction you might find a path that only goes up. You can think about, about walking, here you see a valley, and, but I'm always walking up to, to this cliff. And if there's many dimensions, there's many ways to walk. So my inclination, actually, is that these caveats, the reasons to think that evolution doesn't reach the maximum, in my, in my view, are not very strong. Except for uh, some cases that are really um, what's called discrete. So there's a classic, okay, there's a lot of arguments for or against optimality, and there's a lot of misunderstandings there. Some people would say, look, is it optimal for dolphins to have lungs? You know, dolphins are mammals. So they need to come up and breathe. It's, uh, it's, 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 maybe not, okay? Maybe it's better for them to have gills. I don't know. It'll, it's really a historical accident, right? There were mammals went back to the sea. They have lungs. They're stuck with them, okay? So we should add the question of time scales here. Maybe there's a big local maxima for the dolphins here, but it'll take them 60 million years to get there, so... But, okay, so let's take that as a given. That's a constraint, they have lungs. Now the question, is there lungs of the optimal volume? And then I, much easier for me to think, yeah. I mean, because changes in vo lung volume occur so rap rapidly. I mean, even between us, there's differences in lung volume. And populations on, on the scale of not so many generations can be selected for that. And so parameters like that, which are continuous, no problem to reach an optimum. The things that are discrete, like going from four legs to six legs, Let's take that as a constraint. So dif depending on what time scale you use, you f you've constrained some aspects of the system, and you say, okay, the other aspects can change. And then, in my view, there's enough mutations, enough time, very rare where there's stochastic effects to, to make you very far from the, from the optimum. And, and multidimensionality makes these problems of local maxima not so important. And, um, and I, think th I think that optimality is a theoretical criteria and so powerful that it's a really good a, a really good research strategy to start and ask, is something optimal? Which, by the way, means you have to really define what you're optimizing, which means you really have to understand the constraints, as you'll see, test it, and if it's not, try to refine your theory. And in the end, if you can't in any way uh, convince yourself about optimality, you say, okay, there's something else here, something really uh, unusual. And in fact, in my lab, we're doing a screen now for, how, for thousands of conditions to ask in which ones is E. coli not optimal. And we can try to, try to prove that. It's very difficult, but so uh, I can tell you the answer later. Okay, so we, we're doing this discussion about fitness. We talk about the fitness function, natural selection, the idea of optimality going to the top, local maxima. Uh, here's a list of... Um, of caveats. Caveats means, uh, how do you say that in Hebrew? Istayguyot. Istayguyot, yeah. So I want you to know there's a big debate. Uh, especially, not only so big right now. I think uh, we won. Uh, and there's no question about it, but maybe 1990 was it. Uh, because there wasn't so much data then. Um, there's a. Uh, <laughs> we won. <laughs> so, so I say, the, the scientists want to know the truth, or do they want to prove that they're right? 
<laughs> I'm so ashamed of myself. They said we won. Uh, this idea of genetic drift, when you have a very, very small population, sometimes a mutation that's less fit can just uh, win by chance because um, it makes a little bit fewer babies, but because this process of selecting who goes on to the next generation is random, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief, <sighs> is random, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, not the optimal uh, mutation can survive, and uh, that's definitely something to take into account. Uh, sometimes there's not enough uh, genetic variation, there's not enough mutations that can recombine to get you to the maximum. Uh, I talked to you about dolphins, giraffes, and um, I want to mention that there's really some things that you, c you can't argue are, are optimal. There are historical accidents, for example. I'm not sure about the details, but there's, there's a, um, a certain blood vessel in mammals that um, has to, it, it goes around the bone. Like when you go up the neck, it goes up and then down. And in giraffes, it's an extreme case where the necks you know, grew longer and longer. And that blood vessel had to go up, you know, meters, and then go down meters. Because, again, it's one of those things where it's really, um, it's really difficult for the blood vessel to just, uh, it's stuck on the bone, anyway, that's what I'm trying to say. So there's some historical things like that that clearly aren't, aren't optimal. And you, or I don't know, clearly, maybe there is some, some use for it, but... Yeah. You see, I'm telling you a lot of stories, so this field of evolution is full of stories, but in this, in this lecture I want to go beyond that to, to the world of mathematics, <laughs> mathematical stories. So history, phylogeny, that's another big thing I want to tell you about. So you, people say, look, uh, you have uh, two hands and two legs. That's not optimal, it's just because your dad has two hands and two legs, and his dad has two hands and two legs, and his dad, because you, mostly you resemble your parents. So the traits you have are mostly the traits of your parents. It's not, it's, it's historical momentum. And uh, again, I think that argument uh, is often made and you need to um, think about time scales. So like I said, like changing from four hands, you know, if I had like, uh, I don't know, like Vishnu, if I had more hands or something, it would be very useful. But let's face it, it's not going to happen. So we have to deal with it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, longer hands, shorter hands, things like that, that happens quite quickly on evolutionary time scales. So there's some things from phylogeny, like uh, discrete thing traits, which are difficult to change. And then there are the quantitative traits, which really vary so quickly that the where you are in the phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree means, by the way, it's like uh, if you have two organisms here, like um, here, is the, here is the human and here is the chimp, right? And then there's a common ancestor, and nowadays there's the other, that there's the gorilla and the um, huh? Ora orangu, tang, and there, we had a common ancestor and this common ancestor, is okay, so in the end there's a tree of life uh, that's shared between all species, here's E. coli, right, we had a common ancestor sometime, and here's the Here's the tree, and here's the etc. So this is what's called the phylogenetic tree. So where you are in the phylogenetic tree, the, more, the closer you are to different organisms, the more shared traits you have. That's a fact. And so, so some people can argue, look, what you're measuring, it doesn't have to do anything with optimality. It has to do with history. And so there's mathematical techniques to, to test where you are in the phylogenetic tree with each trait and stuff like that. We won't get into that, but it's a world of uh, discussion. Yeah, I'm going to race now. Yeah. Well, if Carla and humans are on the same tree and they provide so many traits, so why is it so far fetched that sometimes we'll have eight hands? So you mean some t what do you mean sometimes we'll have eight hands? Well, if, if, if you can see from the tree that you can get this new discrete trait, you can get, you can get, that's what you say? Yeah, correct, yeah, so there's been events in history. This is also a very, very important, th interesting thing about evolution. There have been events in history where there was tremendous innovation and 
great invention of new body plans, for example. This happened 500 million years ago. After a big mass extinction, most, uh, most forms, most big branches of animals appeared uh, at the same time, and this was uh, amazing. So the jellyfish, for example, which have this cylindrical symmetry, insects, or what's called pulcheroglyme, uh, arthropods. On the other hand, uh, chordates, which are the, the ancestors of vertebrates, all these phyla, it's called big, big phyla, like big chunks of the tree appeared. And people think nowadays what enabled this was a really an innovation that was so amazing technologically that the creature that had it had such a huge advantage that no matter how screwed up their children were, they're going to still explode it exponentially, explode so that you could innovate tremendously and go down these valleys and explore body plants. And then that technical innovation took over the planet and you froze. And do you know what the technical innovation is, people think? It made those animals so, so much better. Eyes. That's what's shared among all those phyla. And that's what people think. That the vision made them such, such better survivors that they could... You can think about the same thing, maybe as an analogy, with technology. Once you have like a, some breakthrough, and a time where there's a lot of innovation and like until things freeze kind of in, a, in certain technologies and then there's another innovation and there's branching out and, and but th now we're talking about this is what's called macro evolution the problem of how uh, new body plans are generated the big jumps how, f how things began to fly how vision came to be all these things the, in the inventions that's a really exciting part of uh, evolutionary theory, and I want to say there's a lot to do there, there's a lot of mystery, how these things happen exactly. And what, a lot of, <coughs> but we're going to talk about microevolution, reaching the maxima, a little bit more down to earth. Yeah, I see there's a question. We're leading a discussion here, it's like a humanities class. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, here, again, this is a question, in theory, there's tons of work about being stuck here, so mutations and selection would actually make this be like a cloud around this, 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 top, this peak. Here it is possible because it's a local maximum, yeah. but the question is, uh, if it can be stuck in a, in here. a minimum or long Here, here, stuck in a minimum. There's even models about multi-gene effects that uh, that claim that in certain situations you can be stuck at a local minimum because of the dynamic properties of the mutations. But uh, I, I don't buy it. But that's, that's, that exists. Um, and you can, uh, if you're interested in this uh, field called population genetics, which is very mathematical, and there's a good book by, the good book is, is yeah, there's Clark and Hartle and, the, and Gillespie. How do you say Gillespie? With Y or? I-E? So these, these two books about the math of this, this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of stochastic processes there. And there a lot of different effects can happen. That's why it's so important to do experiments. That's why I'm dying to tell you about the experiments. I want to tell you about the advances, and it's not so far, it's only 2005 when the experiments began to quantitate these things. Okay. So uh, I'm going to tell you about an experiment and of course about a theory and experiment and everything. And uh, to do that, we're going to, uh, again, I said we, we want to study fitness functions we want to study how quickly, do, do things go to the optimum under the best conditions we can give them? How quickly that happens? How precisely? How many solutions there are? How do we calculate the fitness function? How do we calculate the optimum? What's going, and what's going on? So that's, that's the goal. Okay? 
And so we have to choose, as in, always, we have to choose an experimental system. So, like in physics, if you want to understand the uh, energy levels, you, want, you go to the hydrogen atom, right? So, you already know that E. coli, it's like the hydrogen atom, and inside E. coli, you want to talk about, again about the trait, simplest trait, the expression level of a protein. So, we choose the best understood system inside E. coli, and that's the LAC system. So, I want to tell you about it. That will be, it has some details you need to know. It enables E. coli to grow on the sugar lactose. So you need to know this word, sugar lactose. L will be the concentration of lactose in the environment, in the test tube we're going to give the E. coli. So how does E. coli grow on the sugar lactose? It has some genes. They're called the lac genes. How do, why are they called the lac genes? Because they were discovered because when there's a mutation in them that destroys them, E. coli can't grow on the sugar lactose. It can grow on other sugars, but not on sugar lactose. That's why they're called lac. And uh, those genes, this is the DNA, are, and again, every biologist knows this by heart. And there's three genes. And they're sitting right next to each other on the DNA. And they're made from the same piece of RNA. So the first protein is called LACZ. The second one is called LACY. The third one is called LACA. This is what's called the LAC operon. Series of genes that are made from the same RNA. And there's a promoter, like you learned. And there's another gene, LACI, which represses LACZYA. And lactose binds to it and alleviates this repression. So when lactose binds to it, it, can't, it goes into a conformational change. It can't bind the DNA anymore. Therefore, when there's lactose around, the cells make those proteins, LAC, ZYA. What do they do, these proteins? So this is E. coli. LAC Y is a pump that uh, brings lactose into the cell. Lac Z is an enzyme that takes this lactose and chops it up into carbon, you can say. So this is the enzyme, Lac Z. The enzyme we're going to be interested in is the one that takes the lactose and does the first step of breaking it down so the cell can use the carbon to make new stuff and also uh, ATP to make energy, etc. And A is, is uh, after all these years, after Mono and Jacob and everything from the 40s and 50s, not clear. Sorry. And, and there, there's a, what, we, what is known is that it, it, a cell, it can modify the sugars that are imported in by lac Y and probably has a, a role in detoxifying the environment against sugars that look like lactose but are toxic. It's not clear, so that's also something to know. But uh, if you delete it, get rid of it, the cell can still grow on the sugar lactose, so it's probably not so important for the particular function we're going to describe. Hopefully. Okay. Uh, and it's very famous because with this uh, set of genes, the whole concept of repressors and, and binding sites and promoters and, op all, and operon, all these words were invented by Mono and Jacob in the 1940s, 50s, when they, uh, or 60s, when they investigated this system. So it's really, really um, a, a hydrogen atom of biology, well known, well understood, with some asterisks. And, um, and, and uh, there's a lot of tools uh, we can use for it. So any questions about the biology of the system? Does, lac, uh, does lactose have a direct effect on the promoter? Does lactose have a direct effect on the promoter? Can you say more? What do you mean? Um, I'm just trying to understand the circuit for those 
Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So lact it's not a feedforward loop. It's not a feedforward loop. It's the situation is this is lac repressor represses the this operon lac Z Y A, and the input the input the, sh the input is the sugar lactose. Yeah. So lactose, you can say, inactivates lac I. Lac I is a tetramer. It binds the DNA, even in two places, makes a loop like that. And when lactose binds it, it goes into a conformation where it can't bind the DNA so well. It floats off. The loop opens. And the lactose can, lac Z Y can be expressed. Okay. So this kind of situation. And there's a lot of interesting. There's a lot of interesting things. That when there's no lactose around, th this is shut off, but there's still a leakage, a, a few pumps to enable to, to in, in, uh, put in the first lactose if lactose is around. And there's just tons of uh, interesting questions with the system. And actually, we work on it almost for every biological question we're interested in. We could use the system to, to answer or to. All right. So um, I want to tell you that the cell uh, makes 60,000 copies of Z when there is a, a lot saturating, right? Infinite saturating, saturating sugar around. So if I put in a, a lot of lactose, the make, cell makes 60,000 copies of the genes. This is going to be Z wild type, 60,000 per cell. So uh, this is the number I want to understand. Why? when I uh, add a lot of sugar to the extent that the cell can make more Z. This is the maximum Z it can make. It makes 60,000 per cell. Why not 50,000? Why not 70,000? What's, how can we understand this number? Where does it come from? Right? That's the trait that I'm interested in here. And you know, if you do an experiment and you add lactose to the cells and you measure how much Z they make, you get a, a graph like this. And here, this is Z wild type. It's, this is a saturating amount, 60,000 per cell. The halfway point is at around um, half a millimolar or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So that's it's a steep function. So, so the, this is what this is what this regulatory function does. This is the input function of the Z promoter. You can say we want to we want to understand it. Now, um, this brilliant biologist um, Jacques Monod was working on the system. You know, during beginning during World War II, and he was also. In the resistance, French resistance, he was fighting and shooting and coming to the lab and escaping, and this is a really brave story. And, and Jacob is a Holocaust survivor that could also work on the system afterwards. And they together discovered all the stuff and got the Nobel Prize in the 60s, etc. They wanted to have a way to um, express the system without lactose because they wanted to have clean experiments. And they made a, a very useful chemical tool that we're going to use now, which is um, actually let me let me say, tell this story in a different way. Okay. Um, oh, maybe let me t tell the story in the way I started. So. Uh, to induce the genes uh, without uh, lactose. So they wanted a chemical that looks like lactose, where they can induce these genes, but the cells can't eat it. They want to separate the eating with, from the regulation. And they uh, went to, to an organic chemist to make something like that. So here, I just want to tell you that lactose is a sugar that looks like a hexagon connected to a pentagon. So these are carbon backbones. This is glucose and galactose. And what lac Z does is it cuts here, 
And that's the first step in breaking down the sugar, etc. So this is, this is what lactose looks like. And the chemist made IPTG, which uh, again is a word that all, I think all biologists know. It's, it also it looks like a, no, it looks like a galacto, it looks like a pentagon. Galactose has five carbons. And it's connected, instead of a, to, a, to a hexagon, to a sulfur uh, thiol group. So this E. coli can't eat this. But it can work quite very effectively uh, to get lac I off the DNA. So you put this chemical in, and you can induce the lac system. And biologists know this because this became a really important tool for all of us. Because you can take that piece of DNA, the promoter, and glue it to any gene that you want. And now you have an inducible system. For instance, if you want to make insulin, bacteria make insulin for you to help diabetic patients, you take the insulin gene and you glue it to the promoter of the lac system. And the bacteria don't make insulin unless you give them IPTG. And then they make how much insulin you want. Is that cool? That's like biotechnology in the 1970s. So that's who this IPTG came from, this scientific need to understand regulation and became a very powerful tool for biotechnology, etc. Okay, so we're going to use also IPTG. I'm going to erase now and, and continue with our story. So we want to ask... We want to calculate, actually. What, can we calculate? Is it possible to make a theory? But why 60,000 copies of Z and not 50,000, not 70,000? What are the forces at play here? What are the considerations that E. coli has to make, or evolution, you can say, if we think of it as a person, in choosing this number? And so here, this is a work that we did. Uh, 2005. Erez Dekel, who's a physicist who was working on, uh, in his PhD, the experimental physicist working on quantum uh, dots. And his postdoc, he thought about it like this. Let's say that we're going to first simplify the problem. So for us, fitness is going to be just exponential growth rate in in the test tube. So we engineer the situation so that fitness is equal to the exponential growth rate. And we want to say that this fitness is separated into cost, into benefit, and cost. Benefit minus cost. And the idea is that when you make a, a lac protein, and, and you have lactose in the environment, the protein does two things. It enables you to grow faster because you take, it takes the lactose and cuts it down into carbon and energy. On the other hand, making the protein, making the protein makes you grow slower because you have to use your resources to make that protein. So let's separate it into benefit and cost. Right? And now, he said, let's try to experimentally measure the benefit and cost of making these lac proteins. So you design an experiment to separately measure benefit and cost. So the way you did it was, see, first you, you, grow, you grow the cells on a, on a sugar that's not lactose, so they grow. And lactose, a little bit of lactose. So they, they do have benefit for breaking down the lactose. They don't depend on it for these experiments. Okay? They have another sugar they could grow on. But the lactose helps them grow. And to, let's start with the, um, what should we start with? Let's start with the, what do you think? What do you prefer, benefit or cost? Huh? Benefit. Let's be positive. Huh? Let's be positive. Let's start with, let's, let's start. So the benefit of the lac proteins. So here's how he did it. Check this out, okay? He put a lot of IPTG. That means cell makes 60,000 uh, copies of lac Z per cell because we force it to be maximum with this IPTG. And then we add varying 
levels of lactose. So this is L, and this is the growth rate. Be, uh, growth rate. This is zero. This is, let's say, one millimolar. And you get a graph like this. And you can uh, notice that the benefit looks just like our friendly Michaelis Menten function, which means the following the more lactose I have, the more growth I get. The halfway point here is about around 0.4 millimolars. This is K. This happens to be also the halfway point of the pump, the way where the pump works. The more, uh, you could verify in different ways that the more Z you have, that's the more benefit you get. So this is, you can say, um, delta is like the benefit per protein at different levels of lactose. Delta for 60,000, uh, the, the growth advantage with infinite lactose in this condition was 17%. And so that's, that's the way this experiment was working. And you can compute this number, uh, which is the benefit and the halfway point. And uh, it just makes a lot of sense with an enzyme and it's substrate lactose. And uh, when you have saturating lactose, L is very much bigger than K. You just get the maximum, which is delta times Z, which is 17%. And this is this was what, uh, the benefit. Delta. is the maximum growth advantage per lax z per uh, z1. So if you have 60,000 copies per cell, you have a 17% growth advantage. From this, you can calculate the growth advantage per lax z protein. 17% divided by 60,000 is how much lactose protein gives you when you have a lot of sugar. If you have less and less sugar, that growth advantage goes down because that enzyme doesn't work all the time because that doesn't have enough enzyme, according to this function. And when you're down below 0.4 millimolar lactose in the environment, you're already down to halfway. And when you have uh, zero lactose in the environment, you get no benefit from this protein. Any questions? Did I explain myself here? Yeah, yeah. So um, let's let's uh, think about this constant. Keep this constant carbon source. And by the way, you had to play a lot in order to get um, effect. This 17% effect is measurable, but it's not a 100% effect because he wanted uh, to not to have uh, lactose and all these uh, things that he's changing have a huge effect on the cell biology. He wanted to stay close to to the same conditions. So. Yeah, so if you change the uh, lactose, for instance, if there was no glycerol around, no other carbon source, the growth rate would be zero here at zero lactose. And then you'll have, you would have a benefit function that looks like this. And you have basically, you can say 100% benefit or infinite dependence. So this is the, this is the situation we're going to. Again, our point here is to ask what the fit of this function looks like. Do we reach an optimum? And how quickly, for even one condition, for one, because there was no, no data about that. So... You might say, okay, 60,000 copies per cell is because of historical constraints or some drift or some, it doesn't mean anything or it's, a, or it's a local maximum or something. You have to make an experiment and choose a condition. Yeah, but it would change. Sure. Okay, so that's the benefit. Now let's talk about the cost. Let's talk about costs, baby. Cost. And for the costs, he really used IPTG to make LACZ in the absence of lactose. So here, they take just cells growing on glycerol. There's no lactose. And he puts an IPTG. And cells make the lac proteins. 
but they don't get any benefit from them because the cells can't cut down the say uh, can't grow on an IPTG. They can't. And he measured. On this axis here, this is Z. So you can measure how much cells, how much copies of Z the cell makes. And here is the growth rate. And it turns out that if you make zero lac Z, you grow at a certain growth rate, divided, let's say, by, by the growth with no, I, no, uh, no lac Z, no IPTG, which is one, let's say. Uh, you get a situation like this. So in fact, you can, you can actually kill the cells by making, more, if they make more than 30% of their volume, lac, Z pro, lac, lac proteins, they can't grow anymore. And I'm going to draw for you the cost, which we can define as, uh, so cost is negative here, right? So cost will be reduction in growth rate. In, in percents. Right? Correct. Without the presence of lactose. That's the tricky thing you could do in this experiment is use this tool, IPTG, to force the cells to make lactose. The IPT make lactose, make the proteins without the benefit. That's why, uh, okay. So this cost is reduction in growth rate. It looks like this. And this Z wild type, 60,000 per cell, is sitting here. It's like after the, the bend. So the cost, you could um, look at this function and say it increases kind of linearly with Z, and then it starts exploding. And, and it's exploding, goes to infinity at this M, because when Z equals M, this is equal to 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. When you divide something by 0, it explodes. So this kind of function is an increasing and accelerating and exploding <laughs> cost. Uh, now, this uh, exploding cost, it's not clear how specific it is to the LAC system, because uh, Namabar Kai's lab, right now, I think this year, found that in the East, a lot of times the cost is here in this area. It's linear, like this. Can't, you can't see so much this explosion. It's really an open question so much how, how uh, explosive the cost is and why. Why is, why is it accelerating? So you can think each time I make a protein like LAC-Z, like I take away uh, resources from the ribosomes, right, or from making other proteins. I need to spend more time on taking that like, like protein. So I grow a little slower. You grow about a millionth time more slower per protein you make. But at a certain point, it could be that you're starting to hurt other processes, not only the sheer time um, that you could be used to make other proteins, but also since you already um, took so much resources, there's less of those other proteins, and that starts to hurt uh, biological processes nonlinearly. So that's why you ex expect increasing costs. And of course, if you make 100% of the cells just the slack proteins, Growth has to be zero because there's no ribosomes, there's no way to make the DNA. Then. So it, it has to break somewhere. And it breaks at about 30% of the total protein. Okay, so now we have uh, functions for the cost and the benefit. The benefit is basically linear in protein level and it depends on how much lactose you have around. And the cost is nonlinear in protein level but doesn't depend, we know, on the number, amount of lactose you have around. So we have these two functions, and Erez Dekel was able to measure them, uh, and now I'm going to erase, okay, can I erase these graphs? Okay. Relative reduction in growth rate. So, uh, so this is a let's say at, at, at wild type, this cost is a 4.5 percent reduction in growth rate. So if you don't have lactose, but you put put in a lot of IPTG and you make 60,000 lac Z's per cell, the cells grow 4.5 percent slower. Again, it's not it's not a deadly effect, but it's a very sizable effect. You can certainly measure it. 
And that's, that's the scope that we're playing with here. 60,000 proteins per cell cost you 4.5%. It, it kind of makes sense because E. coli can, has, can make about 2, 3 million proteins. So let's imagine if you, if you, had, uh, if you could make a million proteins, then 10,000 proteins is 1%. Okay. So 60,000 proteins is a few percent of the total amount of proteins E. coli can make. And indeed, making 60,000 proteins without benefit makes you grow a few percent slower. Okay, that's, that's the order of magnitude. Make sense? How, how do you measure the rest of the graph? Oh, yeah. So how do you go, the question is how you go uh, above the wild type. If you put an infinite amount of IPTG, how do you go above it? So you can use different genetic tricks. You can make, um, if just uh, for example, you can make, uh, take the, the promoter region and make mutations in promoter that make E. coli make more than 60,000. So that's, by the way, the reason why 60,000 is such an interesting question, because it's easy to make mutations and give you more than 60,000. It's, it's not like a physical limit, a fundamental limit. So you can, go, you can get there. Yeah. So you, can, you can probe that graph different ways. So uh, I think in Iran Segal's lab, uh, now uh, they're doing an experiment where they're putting promoters of different streng strengths upstream of different yeast genes and want to measure curves like this for many different genes. By, ch by genetic means like that. By, by ribosome binding sites, is it by, how do you do that? By ribosome binding sites, or do you remember? Yeah, talking about the acronym. Yeah. And then taking the promoter and then you found the strength. Right. The strength okay, so take a, a range of promoters with a, a wide range of expressions and gluing each of those promoters upstream of, of a different gene, a specific gene, and there where you can scan 100 different levels. So that's another way. And, and doing these nice, so the field is really advanced in the last 10 years and there's a lot of uh, potential and technologies we didn't have back then. And so, okay, so we have the cost minus benefit. And now that we have the cost minus benefit, we can just plot um, the fitness function uh, as a function, okay, so our fitness function, we can plot it. So this is our trait. Z, and this is our fitness F, just like I drew in the beginning of the class. And we have this benefit minus cost, but of course it, it depends on, how much on the environment. Our environment knows how much lactose we have in the environment, of course we can tune it. So if I have no lactose, if I have no lactose, um, I have only cost, right? If I make more and more protein, I grow, I have a reduction. This is cost. And cost here is in the minus. So if no lactose, it looks like this. Fitness zero, let's say, let's agree that fitness zero is just growing on glycerol without any, if I don't have any lactose, I don't make the lact proteins, that, that'll cost, let's call that fitness zero. So if I start a, making protein without lactose, without lactose around, there's only cost. And, a, and I lose. But now, suppose I, start, I, I add lactose, more and more lactose. So I have this difference between these two functions. And I get things like this. <clears throat> L equals 0.1 millimolar, let's say. And now I add more. L equals 0.5 millimolar. And I had. L equals 5 millimolar. That's what it looks like. I just take the, ratio, the difference between these two. Why does the uh, cost always win? Why does cost always win? Because uh, this grows linearly with Z. This grows explodingly with Z. So cost always wins in the end. And uh, I can compute the maximum point, right? So for each lactose level, there's a maximum optimal Z. So this, this little mathematical exercise predicts that E. coli should be able to understand how much lactose is around and accordingly determine its internal amount of Z, which is different for each amount of lactose. Oh, you, you can ask, why should Z optimal increase with lactose? So the, the, the idea is that if you have, don't have a lot of lactose, you make the Z, but the Z isn't very effective because of this term. It works slowly because there's not a lot of substrate. And therefore, benefit is not much bigger than the cost. So it doesn't pay to make a lot of Z. 
Is the more lactose they have, each more the cost, the benefit per protein increases and pays you to make more more Z, etc. And so this is the Z optimum at each level of uh, lactose, and we can compute it. Right, good. Good point. So you mean here? Yeah, because well, right. you have the Z wild type optimum. This is L equals 10 millimolar. So if you have L, which is very, very big, it, it saturates this function. And there's a limit. Infinite. So um, I'm just going to. I'm just going to say that if we plot here. Z optimum, the function of external lactose concentration, which is, means I'm going to collect all these maximum points for the different lactose concentrations. Hmm? The different conditions? What do you mean conditions? Not just lactose. Uh, yeah. The question is if I change the temperature, glycerol, yes. So as I said before, if, if lactose is the only sugar, then delta becomes life or death. So its benefit becomes huge, huge. Uh, if there's, a, on the other hand, a much better sugar like glycerol, then the cell doesn't care about lactose. It's, the delta is zero. The benefit is... Zero to one. What? Zero to one. Um, yeah, I, I don't... Yeah, the, the one is depends what you're normalizing for. But it could, it could be delta could be like the biggest fittest component, or a few percent, or or, or zero. Yeah, and cost also. I'm not sure exactly, and that's a lot, a lot of investigation now. How cost parameters change and what they depend on. And, uh, by the way, um, fitness is this benefit minus cost. And in order to find the optimum, as you remember from high school, we can uh, look where the derivative of this function is zero. That's to say, to find where the slope is zero. And when you do that, you find a formula that you'll get to probably derive in your homework. You can work it out if you if you. Uh, Actually, Jean, would you mind turn, uh, turning on the laptop here? So I'm going to. Think something like that. And the function looks like this. So if I, if I plot these points, there's a function of L. I get a function that looks like this. It reaches Z wild type at a certain level, L equals 0.6 millimolar. So here's a, a kind of prediction, you might say. The prediction is that if E. coli was growing in a constant lactose environment in nature, then 60,000 per cell means that what it sees in nature is 0.6 millimolar lactose, if these conditions are relevant to nature. Or if I do an experiment now and keep 0.6 millimolar lactose for a long, long time, the wild type level, which is 60,000 per cell, shouldn't change. But if I'm below it, it should go down. If I'm above it, it should go up. There's this uh, critical L which below which it doesn't pay to make even a single lac Z protein. It's the smallest amount of sugar for which benefit exceeds cost. So that's interesting. There's a cutoff like that. And it's about 0 0.05 millimolar. And you get that just from these numbers, the, these numbers that I, that I told you about, the eta, m, k, all these numbers. You can plug them in and get these numbers. And you have a prediction for um, for what, what the optimum level of equality should be is a function of the, of the environment. Did I explain myself here? Yeah? Why do you like to see that? I mean, just to try, like, a low 
Yeah, so the question is about experiments. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to tell you next, of course. Erez went on to, to do the experiment, the evolutionary experiment, to ask, does equality really do, how close does evolution get to this function? So that's where we're heading, yeah. So the, the solution at that particular lactose concentration, I mean, if you have an optimal there, that looks more like a uh, cap This uh, thing, okay, so let me explain again. What that graph says is what Z optimum is. So for a given lactose concentration, this is the optimum. Right. For different other lactose, this is the optimum. And I'm collecting all these optimum and plotting them as a function of the lactose. Right. So this so it just goes up. The more lactose we have, the, the higher is the optimum. And it gets stuck here at a certain point. That's, so this doesn't go down. Did I understand your question? Okay. Good, good, uh, these questions, yeah. So um, is the implication that E. coli never sees above 6 mil, 0.6 millimolar? I wouldn't say that. I would say that uh, this is a calculation, again, it's in this glycerol conditions and assumes constant lactose. Why? Because that's the experiment we're going to do. So it's, this is useful for the experiment. But in nature, E. coli sees non-constant lactose environments. Which means usually it sees nothing, and sometimes it sees a lot. And together with lactose, it has a lot of other things, not only glycerol. So actually, uh, understanding what it sees in its natural environment now we know less about its natural environment than we do about the, the this DNA uh, num and parameters that it evolved to. So there's something called the reverse ecology I'm interested in, which is how can, from the evolved system, how, what can you infer about the ecology it grew in? So you, you might say 0.6 millimolar could be like an average effective concentration or something like that, but I wouldn't take it too, too serious. But theoretically, it should be able to produce more. Yeah, it should be able to produce more theoretically, and we'll, as we'll see soon, there's no problem can if it mutate itself to, to produce more. No problem. No problem. And on, on the lab, we can do that by changing the promoter. There's no limit, no physical or biological limit. It's an evolutionary reason, we think, that makes it make 60,000 and not 50,000. Because... Did you say, how do we get negative thickness? Negative? Yeah, I understand that it's only cost, but why do you get the negative number? Yeah, that has to do with how we define zero. So zero here, we define it as growth rate of wild type on glycerol. That's to say, you don't put an IPTG, you don't do anything, you just grow it on glycerol, and then it grows at a certain rate. And that's what we we'll call fitness zero. That's like our baseline fitness. Okay, but it doesn't have to be. It could be, you know, it's just the point is the fitness yeah. starts here and decreases. Okay. Okay. Uh, what else are you in wondering about? Yeah. Yeah, um, like I said before, let's not, let's not uh, extrapolate too much into nature because lactose levels change there, conditions change there. So let's look at this as a prediction for an experiment. If you grow in the test tube on glycerol and you apply constant 0.6 millimolar, that's what you, you should see 60,000. In nature, it's a much more difficult situation because of time changes of lactose, because of the, uh, the, the conditions are changing. So yeah. these numbers here are changing, eta and delta. Yeah. But you're asking, is it a typical number of 0.6 millimolar? Let's say it's not so far from the, from the halfway point of the pump, and presumably the halfway point of the pump is designed to match the naturally occurring concentrations, 0.6 millimolar. So it seems reasonable that that's the kind of concentrations E. coli sees. Yeah. In, the f in our food, let's say, that's the kind of concentrations of lactose in milk and stuff like that. So, so it's like... Yeah, okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, we talked about lack system, IPTG, cost benefit, optima. And now we can do the, talk about the experimental tests uh, to ask does, does the natural selection reach this optimum? Okay, so let's uh, just pause to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and I'm going to uh, erase some stuff now and tell you about the evolutionary experiments.
Okay. So John, I'm just wondering if you could check this formula if I didn't make a mistake here. And it should be in the book there. Okay. So uh, how do you test these kind of experiments? So there's a cool technique uh, that was um, worked a lot on by, by Richard Lenski. It's called ser serial dilution. And it's one of, uh, one of the nicest experiments you can do in biology. What you do is you take a test tube with your cells, and you grow it for a day. And then you take 1% 1 of the cells uh, with your pipette, and you move it to a fresh test tube with the same uh, medium. And they grow. <coughs> After the day, they reach a stationary phase. You take 1 to 100, and you move them again to a new fresh test tube. So they, every day, you do it. If you take a vacation, that's OK. You come back, and you, you do it. And Every day, the cells grow 100-fold. Because here, they reach a concentration where they um, finished all the food and they, the maximum concentration in the test tube. You take 1% of them, and again, they reach that same concentration. You take 1% of them. So they, each day, cells grow 100 times, two, which is 6.6 .6 generations. So every day you amass 6.6 .6 generations. And if you do it for a few weeks, you can get to hundreds of generations. OK? That's serial dilution. And we, we're even doing it now. Um, Benjamin Tobin here, for example, is sitting there. Uh, is doing the experiments like this, and it's, uh, it's cool. And of course, you can do it. Uh, so here what you're doing is you're effectively giving E. coli an infinite exponential, prolonged exponential growth by refreshing the conditions all the time. Um, and so now we can ask, so the experiment that uh, Erez did was uh, he made, in parallel, seven test tubes. So each day he passed, you know, he had seven test tubes like this. Each day he passed one to 100 of each. And one had zero lactose in it. And one had 0.1 millimolar. One had, let's say, 0.3 millimolar, 0.6 millimolar, 0.6 millimolar, 1 millimolar, and 5 millimolar, something like that. Right? So each test tube had a different environment, different amount of lactose. And he, every day, um, evolved the E. coli. And he also added IPTG to all these test tubes. So all these test tubes, in the beginning, made 60,000 copies of Lexi. So he forced them to have the 60,000 copies of, uh, or uh, in other words, he, he neutralized the LAC repressor, you can say, by adding enough IPTG. So LAC repressor is off the DNA. And the gene is open, making 60,000 copies per cell. And now asked. How long would it take for E. coli to start adapting, this is to make mutations to change that number to fit the environment that I'm giving them? So this is an experiment on evolutionary adaptation. Yeah. But that would only adapt the promoter of the lack of birth. In nature, E. coli can also adapt to the first time. Right. So we're not, it could adapt the promoter, maybe the Maybe the protein degradation rate, maybe the protein production rate, maybe. But again, we, we want to check. Um, okay. All right, and this is the results. That, so again, in other words, how closely does evolution start converging to these predictions of what the optimal value of Z should be? And here's the uh, results that it has got. Are there any ways of time? You don't. And when you do experiments like this, it's, again, you go into the unknown. You don't know how long it'll take. So this is time now measuring generations. You have to take a risk in science. So this is, uh, let's say, 100 generations, 200 generations. 
300 generations. Actually, if, Johnny, it would help me to, to see that graph if you could. Yeah, there's a, there's a problem? Tree, yeah. Okay, so I have to remember it by heart. So this is here is how much Z the cells actually make. And again, they all started at this Z wild type. They all started here. At generation uh, zero, they all started at 60,000 per cell. So I would say every few generations, he took out the cells and measured how much Z they make and what's their growth rate, etc. So uh, there were a lot of points here. And let's start with the, the L equals zero curve. L equals zero, you predict as a Z optimum is zero. And this is the result. So um, after a few tens of generations, you could see that the average amount of Z in the test tube beginning to decrease. And after um, about 300 generations, he couldn't detect any more Z. And he took these bacteria, and he tried to grow them on lactose, and they couldn't grow on lactose anymore. They lost the ability to grow on lactose. They lost, they lost their Z, their lact system. So. And this is, again, a genetic change. So this, you take the, these cells, they're babies. So they can't grow on lactose anymore. They can't make lactose. Z. And uh, that's this point. So L equals 0, this is what uh, it evolves to. And this is L equals 0.1. This is L equals 0.5 or something like this. It's L equals 1. L equals 5. And there are, so each, each line here is actually uh, there's really finely sampled, because every 6.6 .6 generations, there's a point here. And if I plot this final levels here after, let's say, 400 generations, I mean, this point here falls here. There's this jump here that we don't understand what happened. But this, uh, this can be seen in, in these kind of evolution experiments. Sometimes there are these jumps where something really beneficial happened and the cell will grow much better. But that's, that's something beyond, beyond this theory. So maybe I would say that uh, within order of magnitude of 100 generations, coli came to the Z optimal. It's computed from cost and benefit analysis of the wild type cells. So this gives you kind of a time scale and accuracy of the, the power of natural selection in, the, in these very pure conditions, you can say to um, to work. Now, this time scale of 100 generations is not mysterious, because you can make simulations based on the mutation rate I told you, 10 to the minus 9 per base pair per generation. You can make simulations where you give a probabil probability p for mutation to happen that will give you the optimal uh, uh, level, and then ask um, how many mutations occur, needed to occur and become fixed in the population, and what's their size, etc. And you can uh, estimate from that what's called the mutational target. How many, what's the rate at which, for instance, you can lose a system like the LACZ per generation? And also, um, it is sequenced, took, took these uh, tubes at various points and purified out single colonies by streaking them on plates and taking those single colonies and sequencing their DNA. But then there wasn't this high throughput sequencing where you can sequence the entire genome. Well, you sequence the, just the region of the LAC operon by primers for the LAC operon and sequence that region. And here was another kind of shock. When we looked, for example, what happens to these cells that lost their LACZ system? Each 
colony, each individual, you can say, lost it in a different way. So when you look at what the mutations were, some of them were um, uh, deletions, like deletions which are losses of a piece of DNA. Some of them were um, nine, like eight base pair deletions which cause a frame shift. Some of them were a, a transposon element jumping on the promoter. In the same test tube, in the same test tube, coexisted, we don't know how many, different solutions to the problem of losing the lack system. Yeah. So that's something interesting. So there were many solutions here. And similarly, for these different um, non-zero solutions, there were also multiple changes, genetic changes. There's each the different solutions coexisting in the same test tube. So they might be slightly different, I mean, because we don't have a lot of, you know, we don't have infinite resolution here. We have a resolution of a few percent. They might be, fitness might be, you know, it's still uh, working. So it could be that all these solutions that took over the test tube, they've, in, inside them they could have small fitness changes, so as time goes on, maybe one of them will win, that's likely. But that would take much more time because, you see, if the fitness difference is very small, it takes you more time to take over the test tube, of course, because the, the difference between two exponents is smaller. So, so it could be that it's an ongoing process. It could be there are many solutions with... Oh, yeah, great. So you run with the book. That's really kind of you. Thank you. So, hi, Yuval. Why pizza? I don't get it. Anyway, okay. chapter 10, you can see this, this graph. I can pass the book around if you want. Um, so, um, so sometimes the mutations were not even in the, in the lac operon. They were some, somewhere else, some other gene that together, that affected in a way we don't understand the lac, so lac system. So, uh, there's apparently many ways, many ways. Uh, the, the effective uh, size, the target, so they could say, um, or the rate of loss of the LAC-Z system, LAC -Z system is about 10 mi per minus 6 per generation. So in this condition, this is also very interesting for thinking about gene networks. If there's no selection pressure for this operon, then one in every million generations there's a mutation that you lose it, like a deletion or something like that, which is ten, well, a thousand times quicker than a point mutation, which means it's a very common event to lose a gene if you don't need it, which means that the genes that we have, we need them. We, there's, or in other words, if there's an arrow in the network or something in the network, if it's not needed, it'll be lost. It's very, the, the, the forces that destroy are so fast compared to the forces that build. That if, some, if selection is uh, lost for a while, you know, for 100 generations, 200 generations, you lose it. And so, so that's why we should be, give thanks and praise to the genes that we have. And when we see something, uh, some detail in biology, I think to think about optimality first before we think it's a historical accident or drift or something that's on the level of, of uh, gene circuits. So that, that strengthens my already existent belief in the optimality of the universe and the uh, um so the question is did we find a uh, repressions in lac i so not in this experiment because i think the reason is because we added iptg so it's neutralized it it's like as if it's as if we deleted the repressor we added iptg so yeah, I see. Right, and, and Good point. Okay. Amino okay. And Good. And then, and then maybe. And then it would bind the lac promoter and shut it off. Yeah. That was, okay. So, so thanks for the. I didn't understand your question the first time. So now I understand. Yeah, it's also possible to shut off the system in this experiment that we're giving it by making I, a lac repressor insensitive to IPTG, and then bind a, and become let's say a super repressor or something. That mutations like that exist, by the way. Super, super repressors that don't care about IPTG. And, so. um, and we didn't find them. And um, it could be, one argument would be, that, that this is a, is a general thing I want to tell you, is, is that the, if you have effects 
uh, like a target size, like a deletion, that's a thousand times bigger than the point mutation, then it would be, of course, much more common to see the solution that has higher target size. It's like an entropic effect. So, but I guess if we sequence deep enough, one in a thousand times or something, we should find what you're suggesting. So it's easier to eliminate deletion than a point Exactly. It's easier or more probable to have a deletion than a point mutation. That's actually... Why, why is it? Why is it? I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empirical fact. I'm not... I'm not uh, okay. The deletion is a thousand times more likely than any single point mutations. But there is five million possible point mutations in the DNA. So in total, a point mutation is more likely than a deletion. But uh, if you're thinking about a, a particular point mutation in LACI, that's 10 to the minus 9 where a deletion somewhere that can get rid of the lack of the operon, which could be small, big, because, of course, a small deletion can get you, shift the frame, and, and you lose it. So that's a thousand times more likely. So. Also, this uh, event of a tr transposon jumping, so you call it these transposons, which are jumping DNA, that can jump and ruin a gene and shut things off. That also happens around 10 to the minus 6, this event. And E. coli, as we know, that don't have those transposons, adapt less effectively to new, to new conditions than ones with these transposons. So these, these dangerous things that jump into DNA like viruses uh, can also help E. coli adapt quicker because they can shut off on the, on the genes in 10 to the minus 6, not 10. Uh, so these, these rates are important, I'm trying to tell you. So as we close this lecture, we focused a lot on one experiment. Uh, even one experiment, you see, it's, it's, there's a lot to understand. And I'm sure there, as you'll think about it more, you'll have more questions. Just as an introduction to this topic of natural selection, in the, in the next lectures we'll talk about what happens when you have more than one thing you need to optimize, multi-objective optimization and other topics. But I think the take-home message here is that you can, um, you, there's hope, you can make in certain idealized situations cost-benefit models and measure them, predict, and have some, some sense of what, some things of course you can't predict, but some sense of the rate and precision of natural selection um, as a basis to build on and uh, for understanding the numbers, the numbers in the circuits. Okay?